Thank you for tuning in to the 2020 Mineral Symposium of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. This is our first virtual symposium due to the current health restrictions because of the global pandemic, so we're glad that you're able to join us here today. With a little bit of a twist on the 2020 theme, aesthetic minerals, color, and crystallography, our next speaker is Tama Higuchi. Tama is a 20-year-old mineral collector, photographer, and artist living in Dallas, Texas. She began collecting specimens in the summer of 2015, and since then has expanded her collection to include a wide variety of aesthetic thumbnails and miniatures. And I know from following her on Facebook that she has a keen eye for minerals and especially minerals. She began creating mineral art in late 2019, and since then has been bringing beautiful mineral specimens to life on paper. She is co-administrator of the Young Mineral Collectors Group, a group founded to create support and fellowship for the next generation of collectors. And now here's Tama Higuchi and her presentation, Minerals Through the Lens of Art. My name is Tami Higuchi, and I am here to present Minerals Through the Lens of Art. I'm very glad that you could all join me today, so let's get started. So first of all, my name is Tami Higuchi. I am a mineral collector in Dallas, Texas, that specializes in thumbnails and miniatures with great aesthetics and color. I started painting minerals less than a year ago, about, let's say... November, December of 2019. So this is still pretty new to me, um, but I found so much enjoyment in mineral artwork and I'm very excited to show you guys what I've done in the past year. So before we start, I just wanted to read off of this quote by the Swiss German artist Paul Klee. The beautiful, which is perhaps inseparable from art, is not tied only to the subject, but to the pictorial representation. So what this means is even though the object might hold beauty on its own, the way that you picture or portray this object will also lend itself to the beauty of the subject. So in minerals, that can apply to the way you display your mineral in a display case or on a base, or how you photograph the mineral, or in this case, how you paint that mineral specimen. An interesting question that I get asked quite often is, why would you get a painting of a specimen, a mere pictorial representation of the piece, when you have access to the real specimen itself? Well, the reason may depend on the person, but I think there's a few major contenders. First, I don't see a mineral painting as just a painting, but rather a portrait of that specimen. You're looking at this piece in an ideal angle, in an ideal light, uh, with ideal colors, uh, all of which you don't constantly get when you're viewing the specimen in person in your display case in your hand. When you take the time to sit down and view a painting, you get to enjoy this idealized position and representation for longer than you normally would, which brings out the real beauty and the real detail of this piece. Additionally, these paintings also tend to magnify the specimens that they are based on, uh, since unless you're a large cabinet collector, um, the canvas is usually bigger than the specimen. This is especially true for uh, people like me who like to collect thumbnails or miniatures or just smaller pieces with a lot of detail and color. Because of this, a painting might offer a look into these little details of that specimen that you might not be able to view as easily when you're looking at it in person, unless you have a loop, of course. Uh, lastly, I think there's just something satisfying about having a specimen painted. You can like put the, you can hold up the specimen next to the painting, kind of compare and see uh, how all the details match up. And I think just having those two pieces together is uh, complimentary. So I personally believe that painting is a really wonderful way to emphasize the beauty of the specimens that you already own, uh, especially if this is a piece um, that you want to share with everybody. Uh, but of course, I can't all see the specimen in person. 
Uh, and what's really great about painting these pieces is you get to carefully curate the display side of your piece, kind of kind of like in photography, you kind of pick which angle, you pick the light source. It's the same in painting. You find an angle of a specimen that looks um, that has like a good balance of color. Uh, that kind of creates this nice contrast between the crystals that creates a very dynamic shape. And then when you put that in a painting and put it on paper, it's a really great way to show how beautiful your specimen is. But in a medium that isn't as common as, say, photography or uh, a video. Let's start this presentation off strong with a beautiful painting of an amethyst specimen from the Jackson Crossroads in Georgia. This is actually one of my most recent paintings done for the Walensky Gallery of Fine Minerals up in New York. The reason why I love this painting so much is because the reflections in the amethyst make the entire piece look incredibly lifelike and lustrous. As you can see in this close-up image I have on the right, you can see all of these little shades and details that are actually hidden inside the reflections. They're not just white. Accurately portraying these reflections is really important to creating the illusion of realism in paintings. Generally, for mineral art, you want your paintings to be as faithful to the original specimen as possible. Sometimes I think about if I should idealize my mineral specimens in paintings, make them look more colorful, more aesthetic, etc. But over the years, so I've decided even all of the little intri intricacies and imperfections even in the specimens are really fun to portray in your artwork. This piece was also very time consuming to make. As you can see, there are lots and lots of little quartz points in the matrix. And I had to sit down and render every single one of those points in order to create this overall beautiful uh, representation of the specimen. So even though it takes a really long time, everything kind of comes together and creates this beautiful, beautiful piece that you can be proud of. So this next specimen that I painted is also in the collection of the Walensky Gallery in New York. So this piece is very, very fascinating. Uh, not just the painting, but the specimen itself. This piece is, I believe, a 15 centimeter euclase crystal, which is really crazy, because if you know euclase, you know that these the species usually grows in very, very, very small crystals. So if you can imagine 15 centimeter euclase, that's a pretty, pretty crazy thing to think about. But despite the significance of the specimen, I actually found that the most fun I had in this painting was painting the gemstone that's used as a size reference next to it. So this is actually the first time I had ever painted the gemstone. And at first I was very worried about it because, you know, there's so many little details and all these facets and I didn't know how I was going to approach this. But I sketched it out. I very, very carefully planned out all of the little lines and shapes inside the gemstone. And I realized once you get to painting it, it's basically just a fill in the blank or color color in the space kind of uh, technique. So you just go through each and every section. You look at the reference photo. You look at the color. You put that color down on paper. And slowly but surely, this painting of lines kind of turns into the gemstone that you're looking at. So one of my favorite things about painting minerals and painting with watercolor is that sudden transformation of these blotches of color into an object that looks real. So this is another painting I'm very fond of, not just because I think I did a pretty good job at rendering it, but the specimen itself is so beautiful. Everybody, of course, knows the Natwaining Mine uh, rhodochrosites with those beautiful, beautiful dog tooth uh, habits. So when I was commissioned to paint this piece, I got very, very excited. So this piece is in the collection of my good friend, Alan Reuters. Um, and this is maybe the most complicated painting I had done at that time, just because of all the little striations and all these little shifts in color that you can see in the crystals. So an interesting thing to note here is that with watercolor, you have to, if, if you have white in your painting, you need to preserve the white from the paper all the way to the end. So you can see here there are striations and even these darker faces of the crystals. And those white lines are not white paint. 
In fact, what I did instead was I painted around those lines with the red that was appropriate to that location in the specimen. And I basically preserved that white to create those highlights. So this can be pretty difficult because you kind of have to plan ahead and remember which areas that you cannot paint over. Because watercolor is an additive process, it's very difficult to remove pigment once you've put it down. So again, lots and lots of planning ahead of time. So this piece was very, very challenging because of that. So this next piece I have is a painting of a kunzite and morganite specimen with really, really beautiful colors. A uh, funny thing about this piece is actually when I first saw the reference photo, I thought the kunzite was just a very strange looking tourmaline because I've never seen kunzite associated with morganite before. So that was quite interesting. So I am showing you guys this painting because this is a really good example of making up contrast so that your painting doesn't blend in too much with the background. So as you can see, the background is white. Uh, just regular paper, but the matrix, the albite and clevenite matrix, is also white. So I was looking at this reference picture and I was wondering, how am I going to make this stand out from the background, not have it blend in and disappear? And I decided I could artificially create contrast in the piece so that it wouldn't blend into the background. So what I did, I thought about a light source. Of, the, of this piece. So I kind of imagine like a light source coming up from the top of the painting. And using that light source, I kind of made up where these shadows would go, you know, in the crevices of this very textural um, albite matrix and in between the albite and the um, mica that you see here. And by doing that very carefully, I created this uh, contrast in the piece without uh, just making the entire painting look gray because it's not as simple as just darkening the matrix or else you'll end up with this very drab looking painting but selectively finding places that you can darken that will make it stand out from the background without making the albite itself look too dark itself and then of course along with the contrast in the actual specimen I also added in the shadow which I've been doing a lot in my recent pieces and I think that really helps to create this 3D effect that lends to the realism of this painting. So this next painting is of a specimen that I really, really love. So this is a really interesting sibnite and calcite piece uh, from my personal collection, where you have these very long, thin, fairly lustrous uh, sibnite crystals kind of jetting out from this uh, calcite in a very dynamic way. Uh, my mother jokes about this piece. She says it looks like a chopstick stabbing into a bowl of rice. Um, so this is kind of a fun painting for you because the specimen itself has a very, very unique aesthetic. So usually when you paint a piece, you want to paint something that has a lot of visual interest um, because of course your painting isn't going to be that great if your specimen isn't that great. So when picking subjects of paintings, you can't just paint, you know, any specimen out there, but it really helps to find something that's very interesting, that has really great dynamics, uh, and that has like a really nice silhouette that can help activate the negative space of your canvas. So the process behind this painting is pretty interesting, so I'm going to show you guys that right now. So as you can see, I actually used a uh, painter's tape to help me basically stay in the lines when I was painting these very thin, uh, very delicate uh, details in the stibnite. So if I hadn't had these tapes here, I probably would have gone out of the lines and made everything look all wonky and probably not very straight. Um, and as you can see here, I use this tape not only to outline uh, the stibnite crystals, but also to mask the stibnite crystals so that I could paint the calcite around that very freely. Um, and as you can see here, you, you go from the tape to the untaped and let me tell you, peeling away the tape to reveal that perfectly painted sibnite crystal was very satisfying. So this is another very helpful technique I find, um, that will create sharper lines and just like create this more neatened up version of what you might originally paint.
So this is a specimen that I was really looking forward to painting, uh, not just because it looked very fun, but also because the locality to me is very interesting. Uh, so this is kind of an unusual looking quartz, especially when you think about how this is from Japan. You know, you don't see many minerals in general coming out of Japan. And even then, I've never seen anything quite like this uh, from that locality. Because you, you see, there's these really interesting inclusions that almost look like leopard or cheetah prints here on the terminations. Another reason why I found this fun was these little cracks or indents here on the surface of the crystal faces. So as you can see here in the close-up, I've kind of zoomed in on those little crats or almost like pits in, in the surface of the crystal. So this was kind of fun to paint and I'll tell you why. There's a certain technique that you can use to create these like very realistic um, 3D pits in the crystal face. And essentially all you have to do is color in the shape of these little cracks and then you kind of pick a side and you take white paint or like a white gel pen and you highlight right outside the edges as you can see here and that creates a little highlight spot that kind of creates the illusion of a higher surface and by having that elevated surface the area that you painted in darker is going to look receded. And then to really push the illusion, you just add a little shadow on the opposite edge that you did those highlights. And that's what's going to give you this really, really neat effect that creates this very 3D crack and pit in your crystal. So this is just a really, really fun example because I got to use that technique. And not only that, but as you can see, the gradients here on these uh, faces on the front are just really soft and really beautiful. They kind of remind me of... Uh, Japanese woodblock prints with those very subtle soft gradients that you see in the sky and in the water which of course is uh, appropriate because this is a Japanese specimen. So again just a really really beautiful piece that I really enjoyed painting not only because it gave me an opportunity to create these like kind of fun little 3D effects but also just because the overall softness that you see here in the gradients was Really, really fun to convey and very, very satisfying to see when it was finished. Here we have a really beautiful emerald specimen embedded in a matrix of calcite from the famous Muzo mine in Colombia. So this locality is, of course, famous for producing world-class emerald specimens. And I was very lucky to be able to acquire such an aesthetically pleasing piece into my own collection. So I really enjoyed painting this, um, but it was also a challenge because the calcite kind of has this really strange amorphous um, shape that almost kind of blends in together. So it took me a lot of time and a lot of effort to try to delineate these crystals and try to make some sense out of this kind of bizarre formation. Um, but I had a lot of fun painting the emerald itself because as you can see in the close-up, there's these really beautiful shifts in color in the uh, main crystal. So you have this really bright green and then you have these kind of areas where you have this beautiful deep dark green uh, that kind of, I don't know if it's inclusions or uh, just different levels of transparency in the crystal. But I just think that it kind of gives a beautiful effect. So crystals don't really have to be perfectly transparent uh, in my book to be really, really nice. So here are some progress photos uh, just to give an idea of how I built up this painting. So what I like to do is kind of take one section at a time. So as you can see here, I uh, got the calcite over with because I was really dreading it. Um, so I did all of the calcite by itself um, from beginning to end. And then after that, I decided to go in and start painting the emerald. So as you can see from the second to third images, I kind of lay down a base color. And like I said before, watercolor is an additive medium. So you lay down your lighter colors first, usually, and then you start building up from there. So as you can see, the middle picture has this kind of medium pale green. And then the third photo, you can see where I've kind of added more and more pigment and gone darker with my colors to eventually create these really nice uh, depths. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, you have to be careful in any light spots you have to sort of paint around uh, to preserve that color from underneath. 
So really watercolor is just lots and lots of layering and just being mindful of where you place your pigment. Next up is an Apophyllite and Steel White painting. And this is one of those paintings that I really thought was going to be quite difficult um, to put on paper. But it turns out that even though this piece seemed very complicated and had so many crystals that I had to render, it actually became quite therapeutic to paint. So back to what I discussed with the Kunzite specimen, this is also a piece where I had to sort of make up contrast and try to um, create deeper shadows to help delineate these crystals. Because all of the um, different apophyllite crystals, they started to kind of blend together because they were all the same color and they all overlapped each other quite a bit. Um, what I found quite fun in this was rendering the sort of transparency, as you can see here in the close-up, uh, especially where the apophyllite crystals overlap the orange still bite pieces. Um, so again, even though it was very complicated and there were a lot of moving parts to this, um, th this painting was nice because I just kind of sat down and kind of went to town on all those crystals and it kind of got into like a rhythm of uh, rendering all of these separate pieces. Um, so just one of those paintings where I thought I was going to have trouble with it, but I ended up really enjoying the process. And that's also, that's always a really great surprise. For this painting, I thought I would take a break from the usual watercolor works I've been showing you and give you guys an opportunity to look at uh, some artwork I do that's a bit different from that. So originally I actually started painting in oil paints uh, since I was quite young, but with mineral art, I found it easier to stick with watercolor just because watercolor um, really helped convey that sense of transparency that a lot of my mineral specimens that I paint have. That being said, um, oil paintings are quite interesting uh, in terms of mineral art just because uh, oil paints have this very, very um, opaque property. So instead of my usual technique of preserving the white of paper uh, to create highlights, I found that with my oil paints, I could just focus first on building up really, really deep colors uh, without worrying about those highlights because I could just add those highlights in uh, with a thick glob of white paint towards the end. So this change in my painting process um, kind of allowed me to experiment a little bit more uh, with colors and with form uh, when painting with oils. So this here is a uh, "Quote unquote alien eye fluorite um, from that famous find in uh, Orongo, the Orongo region, Namibia, and I thought this was quite interesting to do in oil uh, because the phantoms that you see in these alien eye fluorites are very, very deep, uh, and there's a lot of contrast between those phantoms and the uh, main green body of the fluorite. So I found that getting that depth of color was much easier to do with oil paints." Uh, another thing I tried differently with this uh, painting besides changing up the medium was instead of painting the entire specimen in full, I decided to take a closer look at this piece and instead crop in and focus on a particularly interesting part of the specimen. Uh, so this for this painting, I decided to paint the top half of the specimen. Uh, the bottom half had mostly smaller crystals and uh, primarily the albite matrix. But this top half had um, a few crystals with the really, really deep, uh, really sharp phantoms uh, that I thought would make a really great focal point for this painting. Uh, so that's why the, the, this photo is not cropped. This is actually um, how the painting looks in real life. Uh, so again, even though I usually do watercolors for my mineral art, it's fun to dabble into oils once in a while and try to experiment a little bit and see uh, how far I can push um, the way that I convey minerals in this new medium that you don't really see very often in mineral art. So this specimen, another amethyst from Georgia in the collection of the Walensky Gallery, is just a really nice piece because you have this really nice, euhedral, clean amethyst situated in this kind of contrasting beautiful white uh, quartz matrix. So this piece is kind of interesting because uh, when you first think of amethyst, 
you think of, you know, a purple crystal, um, you know, sometimes various shades, lightnesses and darknesses of purple, but still purple. But if you look closely at your reference pictures and closely at your specimens, you'll realize just because you have this idea in your head of what color a piece should be, doesn't mean that when you put it down on paper, it's gonna be exactly that color. So if you see here in the middle, you kind of get these warmer, almost uh, pinkish yellow tones. And when you think of amethyst and you want to paint amethyst, you're like, oh, I'm just going to paint this purple. But for from in my example, um, I looked at this reference picture and I saw these tones of yellow. And I made sure to uh, show these yellow pigments uh, in this crystal. So it doesn't mean that your entire painting is going to look like a yellow amethyst. Um, but these like little shifts in color, these little details um, in hue will add to the effect of uh, realism in your painting. I'm really, really excited to show you guys this painting um, just because this is one of my favorite specimens in my collection uh, from the Oranga Mountains, which is one of my favorite localities. Uh, but also because this is probably one of the first paintings I was really, really proud of. Uh, so this is an aquamarine and shore combination piece, um, like I said, from Namibia. And the color contrast, I think, really lends itself uh, to paintings, not just the specimen, but a lot of pieces from Morongo. So this piece, I think, was really, really successful because I was very careful in creating these like very, very small details in this painting. So you have the highlight on the upper side of the aquamarine, but when you actually look closely in the aquamarine, especially with, with these Aranga pieces where um, a lot of the crystals can be rather opaque, you see all of these little details and striations and even imperfections or uh, even coatings of little iron oxides. And I think it's really important to convey all of the small details in your paintings because that will, again, add to that effect of realism that we strive for in mineral artwork, or at least uh, in my mineral artwork. So I took a lot of care to get all of these little details down, no matter how long it took. And uh, what also helped was doing my best to convey the textures, especially on the shoral. So as you can see on this right side, uh, the shoral has this kind of strange texture on one of the faces. Um, it was surprisingly easy uh, to render. I just kept adding on black color until, in random spots until it looked good. Um, but overall, just a very textural piece and all these different shades and colors and different textures uh, kind of come together to create this very complex painting that I ended up very, very happy with. And I believe this is also the first painting um, where I decided to leave the background white instead of black. Because um, I used to paint all of my pieces on black backgrounds. And I think, I, I believe the reason why I decided to paint this on a white background was, of course, because the shoral would kind of disappear into that black. And then once I realized um, how nice these pieces looked on, on a white background, I decided, shoot, I should start doing this from now on. And then, of course, the white background also allows me to get that really nice uh, drop shadow underneath the crystal. And I think that really adds to the piece overall, uh, alongside the different textures and colors that you see here. Here's a painting of a beautiful pink fluorite on deep, dark, smoky quartz uh, from Fronthorn in Switzerland. So this specimen was rather difficult to paint for me, just because as you can see here, on the right side of the fluorite, there's a very complicated reflection. So the reason why this reflection is, again, so complicated is because there's all these different textures and steps on the face of the fluorite that you really see when the light hits at a certain angle. So I had to figure out how to navigate this piece and figure out how to carefully render the reflection so that it actually looked realistic. So I want to show you guys here some progress photos that I took as I was doing this. Now, the big thing to know here is that this painting went through a serious ugly duckling phase. So the tricky thing about reflections is it looks terrible until it doesn't. So in this first image, as you can see, 
it doesn't look like a reflection at all. All you really see are these kind of odd random lines everywhere with these weird colors and then these kind of strange blocks of like a yellowish color next to a purplish color. So I was looking at my reference picture very carefully and I was trying to pick up on the colors and try to get everything as accurate as possible in the reflection. Um, but I, I was starting to panic a little bit just because it looks so weird and it didn't look like a reflection at all. But what I realized is, you know, while you're working on this reflection, you're only focusing on the side of the crystal that has a reflection. So as you can see here, I was doing that part first and the area that's left in the shadow with a darker color still wasn't painted over. So I finished the reflection side. It looked crazy. I hated it, but I decided, okay, just take a break from that, go to the other side. So I went and I painted in those darker colors in the shadowed area. And I realized that made a huge, huge difference in creating the illusion of, of a reflection. So what's important is that even though the components of a painting, like the different crystals um, or the different faces might look kind of weird on their own, but once you have different faces or different crystals you know, completed and shown together, it creates the full picture of the specimen. So the light color of the reflection side didn't make any sense to the eye until you had the other side of the crystal painted in the shadows, which created this contrast that showed this is the light side and this is the dark side. This is the shadow and this is the reflection. So it looks a little crazy when you first start out, but you trust in the process, you carefully look at your reference photo. And if you do all of that correctly and you paint what you see, it should all turn out just fine. So here's another aquamarine swirl specimen, this time from the Shigar district in Pakistan. This piece is in the uh, collection of the Walensky Gallery of Fine Minerals up in New York as well. So the reason why I'm presenting this piece is because I've painted this one on a rather small piece of paper. So most of the mineral specimens that I do are usually on an eight by 10 inch piece of paper at least. So this piece was kind of a challenge as well, just because it turns out it's really difficult to convey detail on a smaller piece of paper. You have less room to convey these fine details and it's difficult to make these details even smaller. So I had to use very, very fine brushes and I had to be very careful with where I placed my pigments. Uh, kind of a funny thing about this painting as well is um, the blue color, I used a uh, phthalo blue uh, pigment. And I'm sure some of you guys are pretty familiar with the phthalo blue pigment by now, just because of that whole uh, Ohela mine uh, Windex blue hemomorphite fiasco that happened recently. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of interesting because I was already familiar with the dye. Um, and they look the same, the color checks out. <laughs> but this was a very uh, fun specimen for me to paint just because the color is just so beautiful and so bright. And these long, large aquamarine crystals cross over each other in a really dynamic way. Um, and that blue contrasts really nicely with the shoral. So you get this really aesthetic piece that translates very nicely into watercolor. I had a lot of fun with this. And then of course, the transparency and the luster of the aquamarine was really, really fun to convey. I find that contrary to what you may think, painting translucent minerals uh, and lustrous minerals, I think, comes out much nicer than more matte pieces. It seems like it would be more difficult to render these transparent, uh, lustrous pieces on paper, but I think that when done correctly, those kinds of textures kind of create some more realistic uh, representation of the specimen overall. All right, so this painting really, really did me in. So, of course, this is a really beautiful blue cap tourmaline associated with morganite from the famous tourmaline queen mine in the Apollo Mining District in California. So, the reason why this is so, so difficult for me to paint is because it is tourmaline. 
So the interesting about tourmaline, which I think makes it so appealing to so many people, is there's so much dimensionality in these species. So tourmaline often has very sophisticated zoning and even fractures and different layers inside the crystal. But the thing is, along with that dimension inside the crystal, oftentimes uh, when you're painting this, the reference photo has well, a nice highlight on the outside of the crystal. So it highlights the striations and the luster on the outside while also showing the dimensionality and the zoning inside. So when you try to paint that, it becomes really, really difficult because you have to find a way to show the zoning and the color changes inside the crystal while also maintaining these quite significant, you know, multiple light serrations on the outside. So that means very, very careful planning. You have to be very careful where you put your pigment because you don't want to go over an area with too much color if that's where a highlight's supposed to be. But then you also have to go in between those highlights and create those gradients of color without disturbing them. So because of this, tourmaline paintings for me take a very, very long time. But of course, when done correctly, they come out quite nice. Speaking of tourmaline, uh, here's a piece that actually did not make me absolutely break down when painting it. So this is an indiculite specimen, also in the collection of the Walensky Gallery. Um, but this piece for me was very, very fun to make uh, just because unlike the other specimen, the reference photo for this piece was completely backlit. So the reason why this piece was backlit instead of just having regular lighting was to show off the very subtle zoning here in this piece. So you have these kind of nice blue shades that are interrupted by these kind of pale minty green bands. And then this of course was much easier to paint just because all I had to do was create a nice even wash of these kind of colors with the blue and the green. And then I could just go over that with a darker paint to create these striations. This piece might be one of my favorite paintings I've ever done just because the striations came out really nice and even. I used a ruler, of course, um, and the terminations just came out very nice. There's some very subtle highlights in the terminations. Uh, they came out looking kind of well-formed in 3D. And the quartz was interesting as well because I used a very um, unique kind of new technique on the quartz. So what I did here was I... Took, I picked out one face of that quartz and then I completely flooded it with just plain water with my brush. And then once that whole plane was flooded, I picked up some pigment with my brush and I sort of dropped in color into that water. And what happens is when that pigment hits the water, it kind of spreads out and it blooms and it creates these very, very soft, um, rounded shadows which really helped with this quartz because it, it gave this impression of uh, translucency. So I did this effect on all of these faces, and I think that really helped create that translucent effect in the quartz. Um, I had a lot of fun with the albite as well, uh, just because there's like a lot of texture and you can see these uh, different striations um, that kind of, again, lend to the realism of the overall painting. And then just the overall effect of the specimen, the really, really bright color, the kind of unique balance of the quartz with the tourmaline, uh, the indicolite, creates both a very, very beautiful specimen and a very beautiful painting as well. That beautiful indicolite specimen now concludes my presentation on minerals through the lens of art. Thank you all for sitting through this presentation and enjoying all of these gorgeous specimens with me. I will now be here live to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, I think our chat blew up uh, just on and on comments and we ran out of superlatives. That was amazing uh, work, Tama. And thanks for walking us through all the steps in it. That's very helpful. I mean, even not as an artist, but it helps uh, for us non-artists to, to see how to better visualize the quality of uh, a good mineral specimen, which is perfectly in line with the theme of this year's symposium, Aesthetic Minerals. 
Uh, Jessica, I think we have a bunch of questions for Tom. I think we may not even have a break. There are so many questions. We'll see what I can do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Tom. That was really great. We do have a number of questions. So let's see. It looks like a, a couple, both Cindy and Paul, want to know what sort of the average, uh, how long does it take to complete a painting? That's a good question. Um, so it definitely depends on the size of the painting, of course, uh, how many inches it is, and also um, how complicated the specimen is. Uh, so just for an example, that small aquamarine uh, Pakistani piece that I painted on that seven by five inch paper, that probably only took maybe three hours uh, at the most. And then let's say that uh, tourmaline queen mine piece uh, with all of the little details that took at least uh, 12 to 14 hours. Uh, so the size and the uh, kind of specimen I'm painting will affect how long it takes. Let's see, Angela and uh, Brittany both would like to know if you usually work from a reference photo or if real life or what you prefer. So I usually prefer photos just because uh, when you're painting the specimen in person, uh, the lighting can change. Uh, and it's a little harder to see all the details, especially if it's a smaller piece, like what I usually paint. So I usually prefer painting from photos, maybe a couple photos, uh, if the piece has uh, like different complications to it. Um, but yeah, the better the photo is, uh, usually the better the painting turns out. Let's see. Um, how is the black background created from Roy? Good question. Um, so I've been experimenting with that for a while. Uh, not, not so much now that I have kind of switched over to painting on plain canvas, but uh, I use this ink, uh, Japanese sumi ink, uh, which is this very, very dark, very pigmented ink. Uh, that's also very liquid, so you don't have to dilute it or anything. You can just paint it right on the paper. Uh, and that'll instantly give you this very deep background. Uh, I've also experimented with just using uh, watercolor to paint those uh, black backgrounds, but that usually takes a little more work and a little more layering. Here's an interesting question from Angela. Do you ever paint minerals with the appropriate or matching mineral-based paint or pigment? Ooh, that's a good question too. So most paint pigments, the standard paint pigments are usually um, derived from uh, elements or metals, uh, for example, uh, red and blue orange pigment, not blue, <laughs> red, red, yellow, orange pigments usually come from cadmium. Uh, but some other colors, let's say ultramarine, uh, comes originally from uh, lazurite or lazulite. Um, although I personally have not painted a piece uh, specifically with the uh, a paint that has the pigment that's the same as the uh, specimen that I'm painting um, but it's a very interesting concept and I've kind of thought about like how I could make my own pigments uh, and then apply those pigments uh, to a painting that is of the same mineral so it's something I kind of want to explore in the future as kind of a conceptual piece but that might be a little difficult <laughs> let's see uh, Bruce has a question how would you compare photography with painting as a medium for minerals? I think the similarities lie in the way you organize um, the painting or photo or how you adjust the mineral, you know, how, how you just, you know, how it looks. Um, like what Michael was saying, um, you can uh, change around this piece, try to find an angle that, you know, makes the piece look the most aesthetic. And that's the same with painting. Um, you try to find the most ideal uh, display. I think where it differs is, there really isn't much of a difference now that I think about it. Well, one is just, you know, with a camera and one's with a paintbrush. Um, but perhaps uh, some, depending on the artist, maybe some painters will abstract uh, their uh, subjects a little bit more, kind of like what I do with the alien eye, kind of left it a little brushy. Um, so I, I guess really the main difference is um, the painting will not always look exactly like the specimen while the photo is generally going to look exactly like what you see. And then you, you've mentioned it a little bit, but both Dan and Cindy have 
methods question. Um, have you used any other media like colored pencil and which qualities align better with oil or watercolor or other media? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I know that some artists use uh, colored pencils when they create mineral art. That's not something I've tried personally just because I don't have colored pencils on hand. Uh, but who knows, maybe that's something I'll experiment with in the future. Um, but with oils versus watercolors, um, watercolor is you paint layer by layer. So it's a slower process um, mo most of the time and it's easier to build up transparency. Uh, so uh, many minerals of course are transparent and it's, I tend to find that it's a lot easier to uh, emphasize that transparency with watercolor. Oil on the other hand is um, very opaque, uh, completely opaque. So instead of building up this transparency, usually you just, look at the color the, and the hues that are on the photo and you translate that directly. So instead of building up to a darker color, you usually just pick, you know, get a darker paint and just put that right where it goes. Um, so I think oil paints probably lend themselves a little better to maybe more opaque matte specimens and then watercolor might be better for uh, transparent minerals. Uh, but that's just my take on it because everybody uses mediums very differently. Oh, here's a good question. Have you ever tried painting a micromount? Oh my gosh, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, I imagine that that would mean painting from like a, one of those micro photos where, where you zoom in very closely. Um, that's not something I've tried before. Um, but again, that's something I would love to try just because it's, it's like a different view of the specimen. Um, so again, something else that I might uh, wander into in the future. I think that'd be... That'd be would be a fun challenge. Let's see, and I think, uh, oh, someone just popped up, another one from Linda. Do you ever use masking mediums? You know, it's funny, because I just ordered masking medium, like, last week, because, uh, uh, again, trying to preserve the white on these papers is a little difficult, because sometimes I kind of forget, oh, that's supposed to stay white, and I'll accidentally paint over it, um, but I think masking fluids especially, uh, would be really helpful for that. So actually I just ordered some and I'm going to try that out. <laughs> and lastly, it looks like uh, you touched on it a little bit, but differences between using live pieces for versus the photos. I imagine this question is getting at the interpretation of drawing what's in front of you versus what you know is there. So traditionally in art school, you're taught uh, at the beginning to learn how to draw from life. Um, and in most cases, that does give you better results. But I personally find that photography uh, is more helpful for me as a reference, um, just because I can get the exact lighting I want. Uh, I can get the exact angle. And I don't have to worry about um, trying to keep my head in the same spot at all times to get the same angle that I'm looking at, the specimen. Uh, so I, I think photography just allows me to focus more on the actual painting than trying to get it, um, get that specimen to look the same at all times. Thank you. This has been so interesting. Oh, wait, <laughs> do you do your own photos? I do. I've been doing mineral photography longer than I've been painting them actually. Um, my, my father is a photographer, so I kind of mooch off of his equipment and, uh, do my own stuff. Um, and I think that's why I, I got into painting so easily was because I had those references right there. I could just Take out a piece from my cabinet and just take a photo and start painting it. Just go for it. Yeah, exactly. Great. <laughs> I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in with a question too. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have a specialty in? Do you specialize your collection? Do you concentrate on any mineral or country or area? Absolutely. So, I, I have like a hierarchy of uh, how do you say cri criteria for my collection. Number one is aesthetics. Above all, I look for pieces that have like really interesting color contrasts um, or kind of interesting forms and shapes. And then uh, secondly, I focus mainly on thumbnails and miniatures. So I really, really like the smaller pieces. I'm, I don't have a single cabinet piece in my collection. Uh, and then thirdly, I really love African specimens. I, especially Namibia, uh, South Africa, maybe even some Morocco. I think African pieces are 
like the best in the world. Like right now I've been playing around with this diopsis on uh, hematite quartz from the Kristoff mine in Namibia. So easily my favorite region to collect from. That's a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> if, um, if you didn't get enough of Tama, um, she is going to be on Mineral Talks Live uh, next week. Uh, so if you uh, have been following that program, uh, Blue Cat Productions um, is sort of behind the scenes on that. But really, one of our speakers, Raquel uh, Alonzo Perez uh, of Harvard University, uh, is sort of the technical wizard running the Zoom meeting uh, for that. Anyway, um, October 21st, Wednesday morning. Uh, it's at 10 o'clock Pacific time, uh, and uh, Tama will be on uh, for an hour. Uh, that's a live interview, and uh, if you're not checking out those programs, they're really great, uh, and they record those programs as well, and a couple of weeks after every presentation, they they put them out live, so, um, uh, so check that out uh, next Wednesday, the 21st. Thank you so much for the introduction and to all the panelists and Brian and Julian and everybody for uh, making this possible. Well, thank really you for agreeing. It. Thank you for agreeing to, to talk. Uh, we enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you.